Thanks for listening to CarCast on Podcast One. I'm Martin Cove, Sensei John Kreese from the Cobra Kai TV series and the Karate Kid trilogy. And I'm hosting a new podcast, Cobra Cove, with my own kids, Rachel and Jesse Cove. We're breaking down Cobra Kai episodes and talking about everything from pop culture to bullying and personal development. With all kinds of great guests from the TV series, Hollywood, and the mental health world. Listen to Cobra Coves now at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podcast One. Do you have a problem with that? No, Sensei! Sensei. I mean, Dad. In this uh, episode of CarCast, we talk about some uh, auction prices going through the roof and uh, what NASCAR has in store with us. A lot of technology. Jamie Little from NASCAR and Fox is going to join us, and uh, I think you guys will be pleasantly surprised. But first, there's Geico. Hey, Geico, do you own? Do you rent? Well, you do one or the other, right? You know, it's hard work out there. Owning, renting. You want to save some money? How about your bundle? Bundle your policies at Geico. Geico makes it easy to bundle the homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you got so much to do already. Go to Geico.com. Get a quote. See just how much you could save at Geico. That is Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. Get it on. Got to get on the church. We're going to make it get on. Welcome to CarCast. Man Crawls. Matt, the motorator, DeAndrea, over there. How you doing? Doing well. How are you doing? Great. Just came back from a crazy auction week in Arizona. Yeah. Uh, a big, big party at Barrett Jackson, 50th anniversary. A great showing at RM. I mean, this the, the market was nuts. Just world records left and right. Yeah, I was looking at uh, some of the results last night, and um, you know that the segment that's really going up is the custom car stuff. Yeah, you know, and um, you know C10 trucks, blah, blah, just boxy 60s, 70s trucks. You know, four hundred grand. Uh, I, I, lots of lots of customized vets. Customized vets didn't used to fetch anything. No, but then last year, Kevin Hart spent, you know, three quarters of a billion dollars. On a- <laughs> yeah. Somebody spent. I don't know. No, he spent. Uh, sorry. He spent like six hundred fifty, seven hundred thousand dollars, almost a million dollars on a. Somebody, on a somebody spent uh, seven plus, I think, on a either convertible or split window. You know, the vet. So the vets used to be. If you had a split window that was really nice and original, it would fetch good money. Mm-hmm. And if you had a big block, you know, 71, I don't know all the vet designations, but if you had like, you know, if you had the, the, the right one from the 60s and the right one from the 70s, the 70s would always be the big block, you know, I guess 454. Um, th- you know, those would bring some good money. Yeah. But the custom ones were just kind of a waste of your money. I mean, in terms of the guys who put the money yeah. into them, they just didn't fetch anything. And now the custom vets are going nuts. The custom, you know, the blazers and suburbans and stuff like the, the stuff that's well built, built really pulls money. But I am surprised by some of the numbers. Like I was sitting there with Aaron Shelby and Randall Shelby, and uh, I think it was a 67 GT 500 KR went up. Two hundred eighty thousand dollars, I think, was the hammer price, and they're like, "Wow, that's good! Like, that's a big number for that car." And then right after that was like a K five Blazer that went for four hundred thousand. I'm like, "Come on now!" <laughs> right? I was like, "It's a cool truck. I get it. It's a cool thing, but it. I, I don't want to make fun of the YouTube guys, but it felt like a YouTube buyer, like at that point. And then the the G wagon six by six that was like one point five million dollars. Like, yeah. There's a Senna for $1.5 million. There's a McLaren P1. There's a 4GT carbon fiber heritage, you know, cars up there. I was like, eh, do you want the 6x6? Six six? <laughs> yeah, the, the trucks are pulling all the money. The modern day supercars are getting all the money. Some of the Lambos that didn't currently, you know, the, the Murcielagos and the Countaches and uh, even the, um, <clears throat> God, I'm trying to think of the... Uh, What's the Lambo with the mirror that goes the wrong it, the wrong way that always bothers me? The um, 
not the Uricon, but the one before it. The Giardo. Giardo. Are those things are, you know, in the, uh, you know, super Legera edition and stuff. These are like modern day cars that are pulling good money. And yeah. then there's the uh, Mercedes 190s. And uh, I've always yeah. said, now, <clears throat> the Mercedes 190 is sort of a glorified Carmen Ghia, if you really think about it. Like yeah. If you if you look at a Carmen Ghia and a 190 and you squint a little bit, they'll be about the same car. Yeah. I, I would I would say this. Minus the Mercedes badge. If you pulled up on a first date in a Carmen Ghia or a 190, the chick wouldn't know the difference and wouldn't care. No. Carmen so, Ghia is probably faster. Probably a little <laughs> bit quicker. But uh with the gold wings and the uh Coops and I'm uh, sorry, the convertibles getting all the money now, finally moving. Yeah. I mean, those, those cars were, you could set your watch on a Mercedes 300 convertible or Mercedes um, Goldwing. Yeah. All day long, the Goldwings were one, two, and the Mercedes, the, 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 the convertibles were 950 to 1 million or something like that. And, and that's just, what it was for a decade. Yeah. Just like it wasn't that way for six years. It was that way for 10 years. Right. And then just in the last 10 minutes, the gold wings have popped. And as I always say, and I always used to talk about buying the little brother, get the little brother. Yeah. You know, if the, if the big brother crosses a million bucks and the little brother, in this case, meaning the 190, is sitting around at $86,000, um, Go get it Go because get it. when the when the big brother now starts to cross two million bucks, then that now the one nineties are three fifty. I think at Barrett their going was one point eight seven five something like that, almost one point nine million. And to your point, the one ninety at Barrett Jackson three hundred fifty thousand dollars. That the, used to the, be fifty thousand dollars. The the one nine <laughs> I mean, everything used for, to be. Well, first off, <laughs> Barrett Jackson wouldn't have been a good place to sell a one ninety a few years or, ago, right? Or if you wanted forty seven thousand dollars for it, it would have been a good place to sell it. Yeah, but not if you wanted one hundred and fifty thousand bucks for it. So now, and I I think maybe I can circle this back to bring a trailer. There is no more. Who's selling it anymore? You know, there used to be a lot of, well, you got that car. That car's no good for Barrett Jackson or Russo Mm -hmm. or um, whatever. uh, Amicum or something. Right, right. That that car's no good for that. And and the flip side is like you want to move a Copo Camaro, you go to Barrett. You want to move a Gullwing, you go to RM. Right, right. Now it's there's a Gullwing for sale. Yeah. That's it. But that's what Bring a Trailer did. It's just like, yeah. hey, if you want a gold wing, here's a gold wing. Who cares who's selling it? Yeah. And that's, I think it really opened up the market. You know, talk about cars that have popped, ones that we've been keeping our eye on. The four GTs, the 2005, 2006, uh, a yellow one at Barrett sold for 450 and the Gulf Heritage one sold for 725 These were... 203, you know, 250, 350, and now we're at 450 and seven and a quarter. I know. I should have got one. Should have got one. <laughs> I, got, I got that. I was very much going to get that car. Yeah. I was uh, talking to Bo Bachman, had my name on one, could have got one for me. And then I kind of walked up on the car and I. I didn't like the interior, still felt a little plasticky yeah. to me. The bumpers were a little bit weird. Um, the gaps are weird. The, the, like the rear the clamshells and stuff. The gaps are weird. They had that weird, what I call the old uh, CD holder rack, weird vent thing in <laughs> yeah. the back. It didn't plastic, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I looked at it and I was just like. You're like, ah, oh, 160000 Yeah. Wow. I'm getting Seems Aston Martin Get for that Martin. money. Yeah. yeah, get myself a V12. Yeah. Yeah, smart move. Hey, listen, on paper, yes, but now the Aston Martin's 80 grand and <laughs> this car is 450,000. Well, <laughs> the the reality is, is as far as I know and who knows what's going to happen, but 
really the only segment of that, you know, 2005, 2006 kind of supercar, uh, Porsche Carreras and, and, and things like that. The only one that ain't moving is Aston Martin <laughs> and, and Jag. Oh, even though the Jag specialty cars are moving a little bit, but yeah. Aston Martin and Jag just aren't really moving from that era. Although some of the newer, more special supercars, maybe that Aston Martin made are, are making a move, Zagato, something, you know. But yeah, I think like a 177 would pull some pretty big money. And they've got this new supercar, the Valkyrie, I believe that's coming out. And I think that's going to end up training. They need some halo cars like that, not just a, a hotter trim level. We don't need just like the 007 version. Like you need something kind of, kind of hot. Yeah, and by and large, it's kind of always been that way. I used to look at Aston Martin DB7 GTs, like six-speed and a V12 and Mm -hmm. like a cool piece, and there's always like $37,000, you know, and and maybe they still are. They've bumped up a little bit, but I, I, I was always like, that's a ton of car. Why isn't... Why the resale? Vanquish, yeah, you, it just didn't have much, you know. Now DB nine, like DB DBS, and yeah, just DBS kinda, was probably it's got a little bit of a premium, I think. Little bit, but I mean, yeah. not. They just never moved, and you you kind of wonder, like, hey, they're a ton of car, they're beautiful, they got a V twelve, like, are those going to start to move? Yeah, everything else is moving. Yeah, I I agree, I, I and I. It's funny because I think I saw a report that was saying, you know, the predictions for the years we're going to get we're going to get a two million dollar Japanese car. Uh, online auctions are going to double. British cars are not going to move. <laughs> they they never really have. I mean, Jags and Aston Martins just just not yeah. really unless you're really at the top of the food it was, chain. Yeah, it was like special. F- Four or five years ago, we started to see some some like world records on British cars, but the racing cars, right? right we started right. seeing like you know some of the the best of the best Lama cars and Jags and Astons, and then we started to see some real money from those. But I guess that's where it starts, right? You got to go to the rarest of the bunch, and that's usually the racing car world. And then how does it start to trickle down from there? But you know, we we talked about this on the phone as well was just when I was running around Barrett is I don't know about the super low mile cars. I'd like the special cars more. It's like, look, I obviously I have a Ford lightning. I like it. It's fun. One just sold on bring a trailer with 1200 miles for $50,000. It's a $10,000 truck. And now it's because of the low mile factor, it's 50,000. So that, that part of the collector car world is creeping up and I don't know. Like, I kind of would caution those buyers. Uh, you know, if you're getting a bone stock, you know, uh, Acura or even something a little special or like a bone stock Civic Type R, you know, if you bought one today and you had seven miles on it and you put it on the shelf for 30 years and then sold it, like, I, I mean, I don't know if that's the right car. Yeah, buy some. <laughs> Tesla or Apple stock instead. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Buy some, yeah. Uh, buy some of that, or, you know, or you buy know, that thing and have some fun with it, and buy some Tesla stock. You know the 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 one car that I basically like that never really can get out of its own way in the collector car appreciation market, while everything else is going up around it, is the Pantera. Yeah, they they kind of creep up. They're kind of cool. They're, you know, mid-engine. Interestingly enough, the other, like, Bizzarini and stuff like that. I think in Bizzarini? i trying to think of the other uh, V8-powered, you know, American power plant, Italian design. Those things are, are popping. Everything is, like, literally mm-hmm. gone up around the Pantera. The, the vets and the newer stuff and the older stuff and and, and the, like newer specialty Mustangs and stuff right. like that. And the Pantera just sort of hangs out. They're they're creeping yeah. up a little bit. But we're not talking about modified wide body, whatever. We're talking about like original or restored like GTS, Pantera, you know, like some of the, yeah. the nice ones. Yeah. 
I, I don't I don't know what's going on with those. Yeah, and uh, the mangusta, I which is another apparently. kind of pantera, yeah. essentially. The mangustas are 350, 400. Yeah. You know, those popped up. Everything, the the poor pantera just kind of remains. Yeah. Even even viper, I think, is moving. Viper's moving Viper's hard. Viper's moving. Yeah. I don't know why I buy pantera. That's a cool car. I, I, I agree. It's a, like, go get yourself a nice stock pantera. And uh, enjoy it and yeah. sit on it a little bit. And it's got to go up. You know what else caught attention recently is Testarossa. Testarossa was 100 grand, sitting at 100 grand for a while, big mirror off to the side. And now they're jumping. Now, in the Testarossa world, the last sort of version of it that I always liked was the 512M. Now, mm-hmm. the one that looks like a modern Testarossa. It has the covers over the lights, not the pop-up lights, right? Right. It looks like a Testarossa with fixed lights. Mm-hmm. That car was cool. Testarossa's was a hundred grand, maybe a hundred fifty, and those were four hundred to four fifty. But it was the best of the bunch, and yeah, now there's a big gap between them. You know, well, that, that car is the um, the other Ferrari, modern day Ferrari. I was uh, looking it up on a hammer time, and <laughs> I was uh, I literally like I almost dropped my coffee. It's a, a three fifty five, yeah, Ferrari convertible. There used to not be much of a difference between the convertibles and the coupes, though. But three fifty five convertible, I don't really like that car in a convertible. One for like two thirty. Yeah, I don't With know that, where that's coming from. I have no idea where that's coming from. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, those... I, I like those cars. You I, like those cars. I like those I think, cars, too. I think it's it's a pretty car. Uh, it's got a good sound. It, you know, like... I'm going to gated shift. Yeah. Let's look at the stuff you want. And, uh, by the way, the um, on, on, on that note, but I will say, I know how much you hate yellow cars. That <laughs> car works in a yellow coupe. It, it does. I just had this conversation with Aaron and... And Randall Shelby, because mm-hmm. the four GT that went that sold for like four fifty, it was yellow with the back sh- black stripes, and I told them the same thing that I say here. They go, "Man, four fifty for that car?" And they're like, "I don't know about that color." And then Randall's like, "I don't know. Yellow's not bad." I go, "It's not bad, but now imagine it in any other color." And he laughed. He's like, "No, you're right. <laughs> hey, uh, it doesn't have to be yellow." The Ferrari 550s are moving now. They are. I, I do agree with you. Probably the 355 and the 360 are the best yellow Ferraris if you got to get yellow. And maybe, and this could just be from my childhood when I think I got a model of one of the cars. Um. Maybe the Dino and yellow. I knew you were going to okay say Dino, well. but and the Dinos we've seen are so moved. many that are not yellow, and they're so good. The D, <laughs> that's true. The Dinos are moving, kind of like the Gold Wings, like they just sat at one price. Yeah. They kind of needed years. to. Yeah, they're they're a cool piece. All right, should we bring in our guest, Max Pata, Jamie Little? Jamie Little's a NASCAR and Fox host, and pit reporter, play by play announcer as well. I got this. Uh, cool event coming up which is uh they're doing a race at the coliseum yeah out here yeah uh it's coming up uh this weekend it's sunday february 6th uh jamie can tell us a little bit more about it but i think you can still go out and get uh get a ticket for that i don't know that that's sold out yet or how they're handling that but uh all right we're getting uh Jamie Little's coming to the studio. Hello. How are you guys? Good. We'll, uh, they'll pot up. Yes, you guys were talking right. about the clash. I believe tickets are still available yeah. for it. Um, they're expecting about 60,000 mm. people there. Um, the cool thing, though, you clash know. Clash at the Coliseum, just to the put clash. a fine point on it. Yes, the clash at the Coliseum. They literally built a racetrack for one event that'll get torn up when this is all over. And it's just, you know, to try to reach a new market, bring NASCAR to a city where we don't normally go. We're usually in Fontana down the road, Adam, as you know. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a totally different concept. And it's obviously tight. It's going to be fun, you know, wheel-to-wheel racing. Uh, It's going to be hard to stretch out the field. And if you do, you're just coming up on lap traffic inside of 
10 minutes on on that track. I mean, I don't even know how they physically – I don't know if you have pictures of it, Chris, it is, but how they physically pull it off. Is the oval there going to be like the size of Irwindale? So it's a, a quarter mile. Yeah. So it's basically half the size of our smallest track. Martinsville, Virginia is like the mm-hmm. smallest track that we go to in the NASCAR world. Um, so it's going to be tight. You can't avoid each other. Yeah. Uh, 23 drivers. Uh, I think 36 are going to show up. Only 23 in that main race on Sunday. So you're going to get knocked around. If you want to win this race, you need to be leaning on somebody. Robin's racing. How are they? Are they banking the track? Very minimally, all the way around. So it's the same. But um, yeah, mm-hmm. there it is right there. So the football field is under there. Then uh-huh. they laid all the dirt over, kind of like they do with yeah. Supercross yeah, every right. week, you know, right. um, at stadiums around the country. And then they poured the asphalt. So it was a huge <laughs> undertaking. Um, but it's something different. We need to be different and reach yeah. new audiences. And I heard that 70% of the, the ticket sales are from people that have never been to a NASCAR race. Oh, really? Yeah, it it it's going to be something something to see for sure. Yeah, look at that. we're looking at this time lapse video, man. That's there's going to be no bad see. seats in the house either. With uh, you know, sometimes Coliseum watching a football game or something, it's a little tough if you're in the cheap seats, but uh, not with those cars out there, and not with as many of those as many cars as they have out there. It just seems. So ambitious, but I agree. I, I like it when uh, NASCAR mixes it up. I, I always love the road courses. Uh, to me, NASCAR is kind of at its best when it gets down on one of those. Uh, where where they go out here? They go to oh god, the tra- Sonoma. Sonoma. Mm-hmm. The, the reason we stop is because Infinian Sonoma. Yeah, the, the track <laughs> yes. of seven Boy, goddamn names. I don't names. know. I to stop and try to. It's like with someone's friend is Andrea or Andrea. I have to like stop before yes. I say their name and think about it. But yeah, man, when they get going on Sonoma. I just that's such that's yeah, it's real fun. racing. Like it, to it me. is. And it's funny. I mean, back in the day, you thought stock cars, they're too heavy. They don't move around. They're not agile enough. They're not good on road courses. That's some of the best racing that you'll see in NASCAR. Now, to your point, Sonoma is one of my favorites. I mean, they're oh, really? leaning on each other, but just high speeds. And by the way, another big point for this season is the next gen car. Our race cars look completely different than they used to. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. And yeah, the the thing about Sonoma is they're mowing through the gears because uh, I've raced there a couple of times. When you, you get down to the end, there's a lot of concrete, but you you got to get down in the second, you know, get around that hairpin at the yeah, at the that, end, and then that go, bumpy section, like that kind of the, shitty they, section. They, of they the have track. The, they have a, they have like some serious elevation. Yeah. They have yes. some off camber stuff. They have uh, you know a kind of a a chicane that you can try to straighten out, but yeah. uh, it's 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 pretty ballsy yeah. to really open it up. Going on up that, that hill into one one a, I know I went to racing school there, and I parked it into the outside wall because it's a blind it's corner. Blind, yep. it's it's sort of off camber. It's it's it, it's very technical. When was track. the last time you were on it? Was it when when we went with Leno? Uh, it cost you an engine? May have been that, or may have been <laughs> testing the nine thirty five. I can't, My, yeah, I can't maybe the remember. Nine, maybe the nine thirty five was after that. No, oh. that was the redemption episode, right? We did. You, we brought the Newman the, the car, nine, blew the motor, uh, then brought the nine thirty five. The nine. No, that was it. Here's. Was, I think I may yeah. settle this. I think the nine thirty five and the Newman Z car were the same day. Oh yes, it was. We were testing the nine thirty five, and then the right. Z car broke. On Jay Leno's garage. Yeah. <laughs> and then the redemption episode was at Willow. Yeah. Right. Willow Springs. Yes. Love that place. Yes. That's I don't like fact. it. It's too dusty. <laughs> it is kind of dusty. It's not Well, the, if you keep all four tires on the track, it doesn't yeah. get dusty. Not many people do that No, there. that is hard. No, but the floor and the fauna of, uh, you know, Sonoma, yeah. Laguna Seca... I just I just love tracks that are sort of nestled uh lime rock, you know, just yes. sort of nestled amongst the woods, you and, know. And there's there's cool stuff around. Obviously, you know, Laguna Seca, you, you like you hit the track then you can hit, go out for a restaurant or grab a beer. Yeah. At, at Willow Springs, you're like, 
Oh, let's yeah. grab a beer. All right, I'll see you back in LA in two hours. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that's pretty much it. True. You don't want to. You don't even want to stay there. You can't go to a gas station. You got to drive why ten love, miles down the road. I love Sonoma. <laughs> like you're drinking wine all night. Then yeah. you go to the racetrack. It's just it's gorgeous. It just the ride to the racetrack is yes. yeah. beautiful. So w- let's talk the about the new cars. Yes. So this car, as we all know, NASCAR is stock car racing. Well, this is the first time I would say it's probably the biggest overhaul the sport's ever seen in a race car. It's more styly. It looks more like a race car should. Um, we've gotten away from the five lugs. It's a single lug nut. Oh, it's a low finally they look like race profile cars. tire. <laughs> You're speaking my language. Yeah, yeah. So look, they look more like what you see on the road. And, yeah. and hopefully that appeals to the younger generation. Um, this is a stock photo of the Chevy Camaro, but we've on our race cars moved the numbers forward now, so they have a different look. Um, they sound different. They're just they're badass. As yeah. I mean, is the best way to describe it. There's the Ford Mustang. Look at that. Yeah. They're a beast. There's uh, we have three manufacturers in NASCAR, and uh, it's just a new era of NASCAR in 2022. So we're running the Mustang and the Camaro and a Toyota, but we're kind of done with the Camaro, right? Aren't we phasing that out? What's going to be next? Yeah, that's been around for a couple of years. Obviously, Mm -hmm. this is more like they're, you know, what they're selling on the street. And that's kind of the whole idea because it's hard for people at home if they're trying to get into racing to relate to a car that doesn't look or sound anything Mm -hmm. like the one that they're driving. And there's the Camry Camry. you see right there. They did a really nice job on there. Um, So and this is totally new for the drivers. They have not raced this car yet. They Mm -hmm. have been testing it like crazy. They've been working through some issues because drivers, you know, they're very... um, um, particular about their creature comforts. This car is totally different and it's flange fit so they can bump and bang and, and not get, you know, taken when, out as quickly. When do you start with the new cars? Are the new cars going to be a clash at the Coliseum? The clash at the Coliseum. That seems like a terrible idea because they're just going to wreck all the new cars. Why don't they, they take last season's cars that they probably don't need now and at least bang those up at the I Coliseum? I bet that's been said throughout the yeah, garage. I'm sure the everyone teams. who's writing a check is saying, hey, maybe we shouldn't run the new cars yet. Yeah, here's it. So it's very interesting that you brought up the center locks because, you know, there's a there's a kind of a Mason Dixon line. Like, what's the difference between F1 and NASCAR or what's the difference between old timey cars and modern cars? And and a lot of it is the center lock. And even on the street, you know, when you get a Porsche 911, you see the center locks. You yeah, go, on okay, the GT car, right, the that, Turbo That's, S. that's yeah. the car you want. And then you see the lugs, you're like, yeah, it's cool, but it's not as cool as the center lock. <laughs> and then when you see the fake center lock on the lugs, <laughs> then, then you get angry. Yeah. That, that's what I do. Yeah. But I've always, and, and it looks like the uh, wheels are aluminum now or something other than stamped steel. So the, yeah. the thing about NASCARs, I always just looked at the steel rims and the five lugs and went, well, that's that was on my grandpa's pickup truck. Like right. that, that feels pretty old school to me. And then I got the the part where, you know, it's like Major League Baseball uses wooden bats. Like it's just, that's tradition. Yeah. You right. know, tradition. And that's you go exactly right. and, and then the training like, hey, man, getting over that pit wall with your impact gun and five lugs, you know, that that takes some training. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? But this takes look, they do it in F1. It's just going to speed the whole thing up. Sports car racing. But this is a good point, which is I always just kind of looked at sports car racing and the beautiful BBS, you know, three, mm-hmm. three part, three three-part three ram, three-piece rims, and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, and then you looked at NASCAR, and it looked pretty rudimentary. And it just didn't feel like it was on the cutting edge of anything. And I'm glad that these guys yeah. stepped up. But Adam loves wheels. I love wheels. I love <laughs> you rims. You excited when those pictures <laughs> yeah, popped Adam up. loves wheels. I mean, wheels and, and I, think, I think, too, it has probably held back the vintage prices in terms of those cars. So, so all vintage race cars are going through the roof, but not not the 70s or 60s NASCAR stuff. Like you can still get that stuff. That stuff hasn't popped like many of the other vintage categories have popped. And I I think it's because they're so just sort of basic, you know, and so, sort of a lot of steel. They look pretty heavy, leaf springs and, you know, mm-hmm. live rear axles and steel rims yeah. and stuff like that. And I'm glad to see them 
evolved this way. Yeah, I mean, you said it. It was all about tradition. NASCAR has held on to their traditions so closely, and they didn't want to be like IndyCar or F1. And they finally, you know, people have come in and they've said, we need to make some changes. You know, there's a lot of things maybe about our sport that are stale, and maybe we're missing the boat on a lot of potential fans out there. And so this year, I mean, this has been a few years in the making, obviously, with this car, but not just the car, but, you know, tracks that we're going to, trying something like the Clash of the Coliseum. I mean, that is a crazy concept to build a purpose-built track for one race to up and leave. And by the way, there's no points on the line. This is just an exhibition race, but you're going to have all the superstars of the series out there racing in these cars for the very first time. Nobody knows what to expect. So I think it was a genius move by them. I agree. And, you know, back to the cars and the styling and everything, you know, when people would get a stock car and they, I don't mean a stock car, I just mean purchase a car that in stock trim, and then they would start to breathe on it, it wouldn't go a NASCAR route, it would go as the sports car route. Right. You, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And that, you never saw cars out there done up like a NASCAR, you saw them done up like in the sports car series, yes. and Trans Am and things like that. So, you know, if you have a Mustang or Camaro or whatever it is, and you buy one, people start going uh, Trans Am versus stock, but now they can go stock. Yeah. Toward the stock car. It reminds me of like, I covered the Rolex 24 a few years in a row. And I remember the first time I saw those cars in person, it was like, oh my gosh, like they're just sexy and they're just grumbly and they're low profile and they look like race cars. Right. And now we're kind of getting to that. We're definitely a huge step closer to that. And I think that's important for people that are, you know, enthusiasts. I mean, maybe you're into racing, maybe you're not. Maybe you just like a car that looks cool or goes fast or sounds awesome. We're getting to that point now. Well, speaking of the Rolex 24, although we talk in Daytona when we say Rolex 24, yes. we talk in Daytona, Le which we just yeah, had. Yeah, we just had. Boy, that was a, quite an ending. Uh, it was. In, uh, you know, great to have uh, Elio Castroneves and Simon Pagano. Love those guys. Our friends yes. over here on yep. uh, the Acura team. Uh, they they won. And forgive me, I, I don't remember all the drivers on the team, but Acura took first and second. Yeah. Yeah. First and second out there. Uh, uh, well, home. first in both classes, I think. And, yes. and maybe first and second uh, overall. Overall. Yeah. First and second overall. Yeah. Right. But I think Pagano was driving in a different class. I yeah, think. Ilio and, and Pagano were in the same car. Oh, were there yeah. their teams? Yeah. And they there, won oh, overall. Who was the... Oh, oh, oh. Because it was Meyer Shank racing, and the, yeah, the yeah. second place car wasn't Meyer Shank racing. I it was Acura, it. but it was a different... No, it wasn't Pagano. It was the son of somebody or the brother of somebody. It was a, a name in the second... The other class uh, win. Okay. We'll figure that one out. Yeah, look you, at you'll the, know, you'll the, know the name. Twenty four. But the thing that was crazy the, about that race was the two Porsche nine elevens going at it. Until I, I saw a clip of that at the, the end. The yeah. last lap, I was watching it live. It, it was it was crazy. First off, you know, if you talk to the Pete Brocks of the world or a lot of these guys, you know, they'll tell you, well, we. We couldn't drive those cars 10 tenths because uh, we had to save them. Like, we mm-hmm. had, to, had to last 24 hours. You had to make things last. You had to, I mean, interview Dan Gurney about braking and stuff at the end of the Molson Straits. Like, you'd have to let up. And, you know, you couldn't. There's two minutes left in a 24 hour race, and there's two guys in a Porsche. And they're driving the shit out of the car. <laughs> yeah. It looked like a sprint race. Yeah. And, and they're driving so it like bad. they were qualifying. It, yeah. it was crazed. And you go, God damn, the durability. These cars have been going for 20. They weren't missing. They were, there was not a, not a puff of smoke coming out of the exhaust. Right. It was nothing. And they're going at it as hard as humanly possible with a minute left in this race. It was crazy. It's mind-blowing to see that in person and to be there and cover the 24 hours. I mean, from the start of the race to the finish, 24 hours, just the people working on the cars, the way that the cars look at the end, but how they hold up, the durability, as you said, is so good. But those drivers be able to hold it together. I mean, they're sleeping for maybe an hour or two hours, then they jump back in for their stint. And it's an incredible, incredible race. And it was so exciting. But 
Elio Castroneves. Guy is pushing, you know, he's northward. He's almost 50, and he just yeah. won his fourth Indianapolis 500 last year. Yeah. And then he comes out and wins the Rolex 24 for the second straight year. I think he's 45, 46, maybe 46 even. I know he's older than me, Adam. That's all I care about. <laughs> uh, I, I know I'm older than he, and that's all I care about. God, let's see. Alexander Rossi. I'm trying to think of who was in. I don't even. I don't know the names of all the classes anymore. Because yeah, the they top two them changed. too much. The the top two cars were four man teams. You'll find it, Chris and Ryan. You'll see. Uh, yeah, I, Ilio and Simon. Yeah. Uh, and the other two drivers. Oliver, I forgot their names. Oliver uh, Jarvis and Tom Blomqvist. Yeah, but then who won the next class down? So that was Dragon. I have uh, LMP2 Dragon Speed USA. That's Devlin De Francisco, Eric Lux, Patricio O'Ward, and Colton Herta. Mm-hmm. Oh, Herta. Yes, Herta. Yeah, Maybe Ryan Herta. Son. That that's what that's right. Herta was driving. Yeah. I, I remember going. I, I know that guy, but that's his. I guess it's his son, right? Yes. Yeah, that's his son. He's racing full time in IndyCar now. Mm-hmm. That makes you feel old. You cover somebody's dad, you see them have children, and then you're covering their children in the race. <laughs> I interviewed Brian Herta, you know, probably multiple times. He came on Loveline like a million years ago. Real sweet guy. Wow. But, oh, yeah, that's nice. cool. His kids, out. yeah, he's a real nice guy. Yeah. Um, he owned the team that Dan Weldon drove for when he came back and won the Indy 500 um, in 2011, the year that he died. But mm-hmm. he drove for Brian Herta, and they were teammates at one point. But it was it was kind of like the underdog story. When I think of Brian and how long he's been around, um, quite a story there. Agreed. Uh, so the question I forgot to ask, as long as we're talking about technology and the new cars, God bless you with the aluminum rims and the center locks, but in the lower. <laughs> Adam's going to start watching a lot of NASCAR now. Um, <laughs> Look at those rims. But what about what about the shifting in the car? Are yes, we, we still got the H pattern it's going. A, it's a different um, transmission. I don't know all the details on the inside, but it's certainly different. But I hear at the clash at the Coliseum, they might not get out of second gear. Mm-hmm. So they're they're looking at 65, 75 miles per hour, maybe because it's such a short track. But um, are they using sequential boxes? I, maybe that's a silly question. I just haven't been. No, that's it, what but, I'm yeah. asking, which is and Chris can look it up. But yeah, you know, in terms of technology well everyone has moved up to the steering wheel and uh yeah and or sequential boxes versus an h pattern right so and brakes i know have been a huge deal and they thing. said they're incredible at the test that they've had they just tested at phoenix last week and they said the brakes no issues at all which is incredible those cars are so heavy and for as much as they'll be on the brakes especially at the clash at the coliseum so um, technology's come a long way, but these cars look good. Sequential five speed, so says Chris. So now we're basically just kind of talking about a Trans Am car at this, or or something closer to a Trans Am car. Yeah, to the to the big class at at, at Trans Am, the, I guess. Yeah, yeah. The GT one yeah. or, or Trans Am. I think it's just Trans Am. I don't. Um, I think it's Trans Am one. Yeah, I don't remember what the order of is, is one is the slow guys or is one of the fast guys. No, but, one at one like and TA two. I yeah, know yeah, I, I, yeah. No, yeah. I did it. It's T A one is the, it's, is the yeah. big cars and then two and then three, because I remember wishing I was yeah. in three. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was at it was at Willow on the big yeah, track. I know. It's like what's Actually, wrong with that almost stock Audi over there, that R eight. Uh, Adam did get a little into the dirt, right? And if somebody got into the dirt, who was in the dirt? No, I got in, yes, I got into the dirt during a warm-up lap. I still, you can check the game film, Chris. I, I don't feel like I did anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. I was going very slow. Yeah. I was coming around a corner that you know, right before the horseshoe at the top, the Budweiser building up there. And uh, I just you know, came out of the pits and I think the tires were pretty cold and I just kind of came around the corner and I just got back on the gas just a little bit. I didn't punch it. And I was even going kind of, the steering wheel was kind of going straight and it just flew off the track. (laughs) Act force majeure. Act of God. It It was was not me. It was a driver error. (laughs) No, but I remember thinking it was right before the race 
I think, or the day before it was qualifying yeah. or something. And I was like, I remember thinking, God, that was nothing. I didn't do anything. I wasn't, you know, you know, when you're pushing up against it, we can show you. Oh, no, we got it's this. Not, it's not, it, the, the car shouldn't have whipped around and flown off the track. <laughs> Put the sound in there. You got to go back. Warm up lap. Yeah, we were we were commentating. Huh? Oh. <laughs> All I, I, I just felt like a, I was going like a shit mess. I was going inside. straight. Go back twenty seconds. I'm going or thirty seconds. I was going straight. Yeah. This happened earlier in the day during qualifying. Not Off at race the gas. Speed, come around slow. Got back on it. Oh, what? Yeah. Just lost it. All right. Now, look, the steering wheel was going straight. The car was going straight. I didn't punch it. I just I just feathered back on it. And it just whipped around because the tires is, were cold. You were going into that turn. You were on the brakes, which takes all the weight off the rear tires. And then when you dipped into that gas again, there was no more, not enough traction. But I was going uphill and I was off the brake. Anyway. Not enough gravity? Not enough gravity. Uh, I blame gravity. It did not, uh, I was not brimming with confidence. When, <laughs> going into the race day. Uh, going At least the there race. was no wall anywhere in your sight. Yeah. So you were no, able to the dust car, her off? Yeah, the car wasn't damaged. I was humiliated. <laughs> and, but again, I was kind of like, I didn't really do anything. I wasn't really going fast. I wasn't doing anything. And then I, I just remember going, God, this And then is- that messes with you because the next time you go out, you're like, all right, I don't know what I did wrong, so is this going to happen again? I did not feel like I was being overly aggressive. Right. And so right. then how do you race when you're trying to be aggressive, and that wasn't yes. even aggressive, and I just sailed off the track? Right. And then later, after a few conversations, and you were like, yeah, we're going faster and more laps. It's getting a little slick. And then they were saying, go faster. The arrow will help push the car down. And <laughs> No, and you're they like, didn't say that. <laughs> They never said anything about Arrow. Oh, no. He was saying, well, maybe he just told me he didn't tell you, but they're like, no, you got to go. You got to follow that car in front of you. And as you're going, that wing will start to push it down when it starts to feel a little s- slick. Yeah. Well, first off, I I couldn't hear anything in my radio. <laughs> helmet. Oh, he was saying it. He was saying it into the radio. You couldn't hear it. I showed up and they're like, you got a radio in your helmet? I'm like, no. And they're like, oh. <laughs> wow. Well, it'd be helpful. Yeah. I'm like, well, no one said anything. <laughs> and then, no, what what ended up happening is I was, you know, fairly freaked out by the cold tires. But then I figured, oh, once the race gets going, they'll warm up. And then they did warm up. And then and then they warmed up. And then they were good. And then at the end, they started to go away again and start getting really greasy out there but it was happening to everybody Mm -hmm. like you were just going into that horseshoe you were turning your wheel this much at the beginning of the race and then turning it way more at the end of it you kept turning it the car was just going straight and it was really greasy and then what happened was is it was that turn eight at the end of the back straightaway you're going 160 miles an hour and I was like, with these greasy tires, we're, I'm going straight into the desert. That, yeah. That's all. That's all I thought. But I was in third place, and the guy in front of me, you know, he's in second place. He knows how to drive. And um, follow that guy. Follow that guy. <laughs> and those guys weren't lifting. They were just going right around that corner, 150 yeah. miles an hour. And I was just like, okay, here we go, and uh, stuck. And then what first thing I said when I got out of the car is, why was I stuck on this corner with these greasy tires? And I went, oh, arrow. Arrow. But mm-hmm. I was like, should have said that. Should have said that ahead of time. <laughs> that I would have had a little more confidence going into that. Uh, let's talk real quick about the Toyota Pro Celebrity Race, a race yeah. we miss going to. Adam's done yes. a few times. Uh, but you ran it as well. I did. Uh, 2008? I did. You won? I won it. That's um, the greatest. 
It was the greatest day of my life. It was the greatest. <laughs> it was so cool. I have to preface that with before I got married and before I had children. Yeah. That was the best yeah. day of my I, life. Adam, Adam puts that second. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm intellectually honest. That was the best. It was so it was awesome. I mean, in the way that it happened, you know, you put in the time. You have to go out to Willow Springs. You spend three days up there with everybody learning how to race. And, and I don't go into something just to say, well, I'm a race reporter, so I'm going to race. No, I want to win. And I had drivers telling me, you better win. You really that if you're going <laughs> yeah. and you're representing, you better win. And so I went, I went for it. And on the last lap, um, we were battling, and the pros start catching you, and you're like, "All right, I, I can see him." You that, know? Uh, sorry, oh eight. This was oh mm-hmm. eight. So Mike mm-hmm. Skinner, mm-hmm. NASCAR Truck Series yeah, champion, yeah. tries to spin me on the last corner. Oh yeah, Damn kept it, my Mike. foot That's in, the, move. in the hairpin. <laughs> yeah. Yep, and he had me sideways, and I kept my foot in the gas, and I won that thing, and I. I, I did an Elio Castroneves. I climbed the fence, Sweet. Nice. drank the champagne. And the next day I was like, that was a dream. There's no way that I won that race. And I opened my door in my hotel room and there was a Long Beach paper. Uh-huh. And I was on the front page. And it was the day of the IndyCar race that I was covering. And I'm like... I'm on. This isn't happening. It was the <laughs> coolest experience ever. It was so much fun. But, yeah, the um, best. she mentioned it in her vows when she got married. <laughs> this is I the did. Greatest well, day other than my pro celebrity race. <laughs> Probably were driving a front wheel drive Scion or something. I was back driving then. the Scion. So Scion. When Skinner bumped you. Yes. You didn't do what I did at Willow Springs in that vet. You pulled yourself out yes. of this. Yes. Out of, out of trouble. And then you got. Bumped off the track or something by the swimmer, Dara... Dara Torres. Dara Torres. She had won it before me. She was the first woman to win it. She's terrible. Terrible. And when I talked to Goldberg and he got ran off the track and he busted the mirror off, Dara Torres. So... (laughs) <laughs> well, I won two times, so you I, got to I, come I, I back that, and yes. win it with the with the pros. I did not I was, win with the pros. I was happy about that. I was not happy about Dara Torres, mm-hmm. which is uh, neither was Bill. The <laughs> how about the rage you get? I mean, it's a fun <laughs> race for the kids, but I was ready to choke some people. I mean, I had an onboard the whole time. Yeah, I, I'm not a very nice race car driver. <laughs> Yeah, I was. Uh, Dara Torres fucked me up, but she <laughs> fucked up her, herself up too, and yeah. then everyone behind us just got on the hairpin. She comes in on the inside. She just on that dive hairpin. bombed that hairpin, and Jeez. then you get all out of shape. And the next thing you know, Max Pappas is bumping me <laughs> 120 miles an hour in the middle of that straightaway. Get out of like, the way, thanks, Dara, yeah. for letting them all back in the door. We've been out to a bunch of those events, and it's just – it's funny. It's carnage because uh, I've been out there with them on all of the training sessions and yeah. the PR days and all of that stuff. And it's it's just a funny thing that of all the training that they give the celebrities, as soon as race day happens, they forget everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dara did. I mean, <laughs> for, look, for sure. we had a couple of those as well. Yeah, there's a racing line, and you yeah, need to you stay think. on the racing yeah. line. And then there's places where you can make a move. But By the, the way, no passing on it. yellow, Adrian Brody. No yes. passing on yellow. <laughs> he's he's flying by the whole field going, what's going on? I must be going so fast. <laughs> or everybody else is going He slower. raced a few times because yeah. he was in one he's year that cheater. I raced. Yeah. We had some good ones. Like Alex Trebek, he loved racing. He was in um, when I raced with the, um, the pros. But... Gosh, I love, you know what my favorite part of that race was? Because there wasn't a whole lot of passing zones. No. Pushing people to make mistakes in front of you. And I forget who was racing in front of me. It was a view like this and I'm watching him and I'm putting the pressure, I'm putting the pressure on and we're going down the straightaway right before you come to um, the hairpin. The There's fountain. There's that, that one little area. Oh, the hairpin or the fountain? Or? Um, right before the hairpin at the finish. So there's oh, that the finish, little yeah. jaunt where yeah, you can yeah. make a pass. You can yeah. set somebody up there. And I I pressured him. And sure enough, I shit you not, he looks in his rear view, looks at me, and drives straight into the wall of Oof. tires. Yeah. And I'm like, thank you very much. I never looked back. And that was the pass of my life. Every every pro that we've talked to that Adam's raced with basically tells them the same thing. They're like, just fill up the rear view mirror yes. of the guy in front of you until they make a mistake. And then they'll get out of they the will. way or... Or off the track. You just got to scare people off the track. 100%. It works. You got to be fast. But you also yeah. have to push people into making mistakes. We have Derek Torres dive bombing me, Mexicana. <laughs> yeah. Great. Let's bring I, back this memory. I was in second at the time. That's riding. That's the, that's the hair there she is. Uh, uh. That's She's literally, her car Where's is her car facing go? the wall. 
That's and exactly. when I say facing the wall, I don't even mean the wall. I mean but the She's other going direction. Straight. She's going straight. And I'm in second. And how the hell am I going to get out of this turn? That's exactly where Skinner pushed me All over. Right. That's sideways. Skinner. Yep. We love Skinner. So then I get out and oh, those I'm, cars I'm against cool. I'm against the wall, but her line was so horrific. And then I got Max Pappas, who's <laughs> now he didn't have to take a bad line, so he got out of the hairpin and now we're going down the straight and he's bumping me at hundred and twenty five mm-hmm. miles an hour, sucking into me, and I'm just thinking, God damn Dara Torres. <laughs> now I got Max Pappas banging into me yeah. as we're going into the Going into the fountain. The video shows it all right there. She's going straight. She missed the corner. She didn't miss. Uh, well, she, yeah, missed. Okay. she missed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. Let's not do this. That was fun. We're, we're that done. was fun. <laughs> Let me give the plug to uh, Jamie, by the way. Clash at the Coliseum this Sunday, February 6th on Fox. The cars look great. Uh, this is a first. Still some tickets available, though they expect uh, it's already, what, 60,000? Sold or they yeah. expect 60,000 out there. And uh, what do we let me give you a plug Twitter, Instagram at Jamie Little TV. Uh, come back anytime. This was fun. Yeah, thanks. We got the Daytona 500 coming up, so that'll oh, be fun yeah. in right. two weeks. Our, that's our our big race. That's February the, uh, 20th. Holy ground, you know, as they say, of stock car racing. So this weekend will be a lot of fun. First time you could see these new cars. But Daytona is where it's at. That's what everybody wants. You can, uh, that'll be February 20th. Uh, you can go to amcorolla.com for live show tickets everywhere coming up uh, this weekend, unfortunately, on the 6th. I'll uh, be uh, doing a show. The Shatner show is sold out, but the Dennis Quaid show still has some uh, tickets left. And until next time, it's Adam Kroll for Jamie Little and Max, Max, Max Pappas. See? Matt, the moderator, DeAndrea saying, keep the air in the spare and the bag in the wheel. For the latest updates and call-in times, follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CarCast Show. If you'd like to write in, fill out the form on CarCastShow.com. And don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes. CarCast is a Corolla digital production and is produced by Chris Loxamana. For more information, visit CarCastShow.com. Hey, Geico, do you own? Do you rent? Well, you do one or the other, right? You know, it's hard work out there. Owning, renting, you want to save some money? How about your bundle? Bundle your policies at GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle the homeowners or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you got so much to do already. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, see just how much you could save at GEICO. That is GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com.